Addicted to the pain, past the poison and polish. I'm heavy with the drip, keep these hoes out my pocket, and I'm way too busy to be listening to gossip. Girl, I'm too grown to be sneaking in your college. I got moves to make, shit, I'm state to state in a major way. Grinding from the mud, ain't no major in my way, and all we get is love, man. I'm hustling like I'm moving weight. I said I'm hustling like I'm moving weight. I got way too many options, I ain't taking no more losses, no. Shit from around me, keep that fake shit ten feet. No, no, no. Keep that shit from around me, keep that fake shit ten feet. Keep that shit from around me, keep that fake shit ten feet. Keep that shit like ten. Keep that shit from around me, keep that fake shit ten feet. First I meditate, we either selling weight or self-medicate Crabbing a bucket, all we spread is hate in a ditch Where a native was raised, by a bottle, by a case Take it straight to your face, there's no stories of glory When you're stuck in the maze, just pass me the 40 I'm drinking till I can't taste, ain't no natives I could look up to that's on the TV screen So I'm pouring out a two liter, replacing them with lean Call it self-destruction, when I'm drunk up at the function, ayy Hello out there. Very good evening. I just want to welcome everybody. Kola Iyuha Ichichab Lila Daya Yahipi. Every week we want to open up with a different song. We want to feature artists out there, indigenous artists uh, who are free to express themselves. We came up with this idea just five days ago when we did a, a surprise update an impromptu update about the dakota access pipeline and thank you all for joining thank you all for you know for those of you who've been watching the show since the beginning we started this on february 9th 2021 and now we're on episode number 10 these are always commitments they are they are uh, processes that we want to be able to bring to you and we, we've just now begun to weave in music into our, our outlay. And so that, that, of course, was Natani Means, who has given us permission, who we've worked out a, a deal with, because I also feel that these artists should be paid. There's some more artists in that video that I was able to recognize. A Kichetu is in there. Anton Edwards is in there. Yaz like Jaws is in there, and a couple, some more people that I just I, I don't know them. But we are happy to promote these artists. Who, you know, it works better for us if the videos are already shot. Uh, but we want, we would definitely want to put them on any of the arts, the music, the drum, the song, the dance, any indigenous expression. Uh, we don't want to censor it although i do need to include an explicit language warning i need to point out that none of the aforementioned in that video or in this show none of that represents the opinion nor is it intended to bind or reflect the view of everyone in the law court the people's law project or the romero institute which are flagship sponsors of cut to the chase LRI Media is behind any of that 100. Shout out to Obsidian. Shout out to Articles of Resistance. And I want to say hello to everyone who has tuned in. Thank you so much. Uh, as you recall, every time I look at your guys' comments, I get distracted from my, my focus here. And so, but we are going to try to keep track of the comments as well. I want to say hello to everyone out there. Beth, Leah, Danny, Lou, everyone who's who's tuned in. I know that we don't we we're not doing all we can to promote, you know, the show. But everybody knows that every single Wednesday at five o'clock Mountain will be on. So, again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you all for for catching us. 
when we're on or, or when we decide to drop an unplanned episode like we did on Friday when Dapple was in the news. And you can be sure that anytime Dapple comes up that uh, we are on board, we are on deck for that. When it, wherever there's a need and time permitting, we will try to bring you cutting analysis on Cut to the Chase. It's, it's a live feed. It's kind of like a live feed. It's part live feed, but it's also an approach to news that needs to be heard. A researched, targeted coverage for the people, for liberation from racial and working class oppression. You know, people who come here don't want to get caught up in political labels, but recognize that there are intrinsic, intrinsic aspects of extractive capitalism that cause by necessity racial and working class oppression and so it's it's done from an indigenous perspective but it's accessible by anyone to anyone who speaks the english language the bastage pirate commercial english language software running our consciousness so Thank you for tuning in. Uh, before I begin, I do want to give a special shout out to a recent development. We just got word of this, and so we'll cover this on next week's show. What you're looking at is a group of Lakota people and their allies who have created something called Chief Spotted Elk Trail. Thank you to everyone who's logging in. Who, who we, we encourage you, please like comment and share anyone who's logged in right now just go ahead and share this with your network because this is the only way that that we get out and uh you know if you come into the comment sections please um you know let us know what you think uh, we we are definitely open to that but what you were looking at that photo if we could bring that photo of spotted elk trail back up this is the camp which organized to prevent the Keystone XL pipeline from coming through just south of the Cheyenne River Reservation. It is called Roots Camp, and it, fe it, it was organized by Oscar High Elk, who is still facing charges. Uh, Jason Lynn Charger is, is in the mix as well, and she is also facing charges for their opposition to the Keystone XL pipeline. But Spotted Elk some of you may know Spotted Elk from his Americanized nickname, which is Bigfoot. And Spotted Elk is the leader of the band, which was massacred at Wounded Knee. And so for Vivian High Elk, for Wally Little Moon, Oscar High Elk, uh, anybody who happened to be there that day, I just want to say thank you for coming from a grassroots level and rewriting our history, changing the way that we know ourselves. Now we can name Spotted Elk Trail because right where the resistance camp is, is the beginning of, 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 of a, the river system that leads to where spotted elk was camped uh they'll be doing horse culture or, or equine therapy equine healing language revitalization regenerative economic activities uh and, and we'll hit that next week but i just wanted to we got word of it so we wanted to cover that because that's that's going to be an important item um, there's always a lot to cover because we come to you live once every single week a lot happens in 70 seven days a lot has happened since i last spoke with you all and i can't cover it all in one hour but we're going to give it a a shot you know just to synopsize or summarize key items in the news and be able to go into depth a little bit about those big happenings um it's 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 my honor and privilege to be able to do that. And we're going to take a look at Minneapolis. I know um, it's, it's, it's heavy. It's got a lot of gravity what is happening in, in Minneapolis right now, but we wanna bring you up to speed on Dante Wright, on 
the arrest and probably release of his killer, a woman named Kimberly Potter, the former, uh, I believe she was the president of the police, the police union there in Minneapolis. Uh, this is the same place that where Derek Chauvin is on trial for the murder of George Floyd. And so we want to bring you the latest on that. We're going to cover No Dapple, Iowa. In the Stand with Standing Rock struggle, struggle, there are two women who are still facing charges based on that. They're each facing 20 years in prison. This is uh, Jessica Reznicek and Ruby Montoya. Also, we have a special guest with us tonight who founded or co-founded the Daybreak Political Action Committee, who was very instrumental, a founder of Mazaska Talks, which is a divestment portal um, fighting big extraction. We're going to be able to catch up with Jackie Fielder. She's a very driven woman, a good friend who ran for the state legislature in California. And she now is channeled that effort into the Daybreak Pack. And so we're going to be honored to welcome Jackie Fielder. And, and lastly, to close out the show, everybody out there has, uh, has got word of LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard. She has begun her journey to the next world to the next reality and we will do a special session to commemorate LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard. As many of you know, she was the founder of the Sacred Stone Camp, which, you know, that was April 1st of 2016 and Sacred Stone Camp blossomed into Ocheti Shakoi during the No Dapple crisis, blossomed into Ocheti Oyate. Now, I want to cut straight to some of our news updates, and, and we'll start with Dante Wright. We'll start with Minneapolis. As you know, there's now a curfew in effect in Brooklyn Center, and actually it covers four different counties in the Minneapolis area, and this is a curfew that has been ignored. The National Guard is now activated in those counties, in and around those counties, and there are clashes happening right now. But before we get to that, because this is such a an important area that we are continuously confronting, I want to mention and make special notice of what happened in Virginia. A brother named Karan Nazario, or maybe Caron Nazario, a second lieutenant in the United States Army, was accosted by Virginia police for not having any tags displayed. But you can see uh, in this video how his his permit was in the window. And I just I want to ask. Uh, yeah, I don't know if any of you can hear uh, any background noise. It might be coming up pretty clean. Our microphone is is OK, but. Where our studio is located in the beautiful Black Hills in the Republic of Lakota, uh, there's some kind of loud construction going on outside right now. But Control, uh, I would like to roll in this video of what happened in Virginia so we can show our viewers, uh, you know, set the stage for what we want to talk about tonight. Open the door slowly and step out. Open the door. Get out the car. You received an order. Obey it. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly afraid to get out. Can I? Get yeah, out you should be. Car? Get out. What? Get out. Get, on. get, get out the car. Get out now. I have never. I'm actively serving this country, and this is how you're going to treat me. Back up, Daniel. I didn't do anything. Back up. Whoa, hold on. Daniel. What's going on? Hold on. Watch it. Get out of the car. On the ground. Get on the ground now. On. Get on the ground or you're getting sprayed again. Get on the ground. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? Get on the ground. On. Get on the ground now. Can you please talk to me Get about what's going on? on. Can you please talk to me about what's yes, going sir. on? Yes, sir. Do not. Can you please talk to me about what's going on? 
Well, as you can see, sometimes the police do the absolute worst at de-escalating. They they maced Karan Nazario, the second lieutenant in the United States Army, who was in that SUV, which he had just purchased. And this is why there was the tags were not displayed wherever the cops might have been looking for him. But you know, you can you can see clearly he puts his hands outside the window. He's doing nothing wrong. He's trying to understand why he's being stopped in the first place in the in the police are adamant about just exerting their authority and abusing their authority now it's got to be hard to be a cop to be in that force which is designed to protect the capital and property owning class in this country and capital and property used to include human beings, used to include indigenous Africans. In fact, police forces were started to chase down runaway slaves and to help round up those indigenous peoples that they considered hostile. There's, there's, there's a dismantling that needs to take place, a deconstruction with the way that the police state is functioning in our country right now. And I wanted to highlight Karan Nazario because we all watched that. And then immediately after, while Derek Chauvin is on trial for murdering George Floyd, Dante Wright becomes the latest brother to be murdered by police in the Minneapolis area. This is the same place where, you know, just miles from here, George Floyd was killed. This is the same place that Philando Castile was murdered and and some of you might remember that some of you might not but these are three names that come to mind just in minneapolis just with black lives matter so i would like to show all of our viewers again if you're just joining us this is chase iron eyes this is cut to the chase thank you all for tuning in but please comment like and share the stream this is a way that we can get independent critical media out to everybody in your networks we got to kind of bring it together and support each other but control if you have a video of dante wright um we'd like to view a bit of that As I watched the video and listened to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This appears to me, from what I viewed and the officer's reaction in distress immediately after, that this was an accidental discharge. Accidentally on purpose. Kim Kimberly Potter, I believe her name is. She was arrested. Um, I don't know if she's been released. She's been charged with manslaughter. And like I said, I want to say those names. George Floyd, Philando Castile, and Dante Wright. Th these are just the Black Lives Matter brothers. These are just the people who've been lost in the Black community. As you know, when George Floyd was murdered, when Derek Chauvin had his knee on his neck for over nine minutes, and you have all seen that extremely excruciating video, that is when protests and property damage begin to happen in and around the Minneapolis area. And a lot of that we found out was like young proud boys coming in to instigate a lot of that property violence where the police station was torched i mean the whole all of america was on fire during that time but i just want to make sure that we mention at least on our program cut to the chase that you know i don't know if the mcgizzy youth center or mcgizzy youth center in minneapolis has has recovered but i know that they lost their communication center and much like our studio uh, we want indigenous media and, and indigenous content 
to be created and to be proliferated. But we we have not mentioned the native community uh, from Little Earth to Franklin Avenue. I just want to say big Wopila, you know, big Wopila energy. Chimagwitch, Pinigigi, Wado to everybody out there on the streets protecting our communities. Um, Lila Pila Uyampelo. Even though we lost that building and even though Derek Chauvin was involved in police encounters in shooting unarmed native brothers in the Little Earth community, we have to stay vigilant. We have to try to rebuild that which was destroyed in these actions. And, and it's unfortunate, but sometimes that's just how it happens. And we don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to shy away from it, but it is, it's unfortunate that it happens like that. But we have to be clear that the blame doesn't lie with us those non-racist people in this country when what we see here is a battle for the narrative in jacketing and portraying anything that confronts white supremacy and and that is that is what we are engaged with and we need to continue to push hard for justice because this is unbearable this is too heavy there are shots fired in minneapolis there is Blood in the streets. Dante Wright has two children who are now fatherless. His loved ones are now grieving in a way that I pray we don't ever have to have to know. Indigenous sovereignty is tied to black liberation, to black lives matter. That was the predecessor to Native Lives Matter. Right here in Rapid City is where that started. And I have to make mention of that, right? On Staten Island, where Eric Garner was murdered, Ferguson, where Mike Brown was murdered, and Minneapolis, of course, again, with Philando Castile, George Floyd, and Dante Wright. This, it's all connected. I remember very clearly when Black Lives Matter was first introduced to the American consciousness, and we in Lakota country said, look at in Rapid City, it's also ground zero. And we held a Native Lives Matter rally to create a synergy, not to usurp any agency or co-opt any momentum. We were just trying to tell our story as well. And people in the Black Lives Matter movement supported that. But right here in Rapid City, Ellen Locke was shot December 19th of 2014. And before that, Elijah White Magpie, Luke Ghost Bear, in Denver, Paul Castaway, Zachary Bear Heels, Sarah Circle Bear, and just recently, about three weeks ago, Ryan White Mountain was killed on the Standing Rock Reservation. And so this is a very serious matter. I just wanted to dedicate some attention to what is happening in Minneapolis. All eyes over there. Um, there are some people who are on the ground like Unicorn Riot. I would, I would appreciate it if you can give them a view. Go check them out. But at this time, I want to pivot to No Dapple. As you know from, from Friday's impromptu show, Biden is holding strong to the status quo. As of now, you know, the pipeline status has not change there is still oil flowing illegally through the dakota access pipeline and tonight we have a chance to address political imprisonment political prosecution everybody who was charged at standing rock and namely those who were charged october 27th during what is called the treaty camp raid or the north camp raid a lot of people did time did our time for that action on October 27th, 2016, including Red Fawn Janice, who we know is now free. She is now back in her place of upbringing, and I hope that she is doing fine. We also have Michael Marcus. I just want to say their names. Michael Marcus was known as Rattler. 
out at camp, and I believe that he is out now, uh, Michael Fasig. Um, he was known as Mater, and I learned all of their real names or their, their given names after Ochetti, but I just wanted to, like Bravo One, I didn't know his name was Brandon Nastasio, but he is now out. Uh, Little Feather, Michael Giron, Dion Ortiz, Angry Bird, or Jimmy White, who is organizing a horse escort, or a, a horse rider's escort for LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard. I just wanted to mention these names because these are political prosecutions resulting from the No Dapple movement. And we need to mention this because I've just learned that there are still two women facing 20 years each. And that is, that is dropped down. That is reduced from them formerly facing 110 years each for their stance for clean water during Stand with Standing Ring Out, during, during No Dapple, for, de for defending all Americans, all human beings' rights to clean water. Jessica Reznicek and Ruby Montoya have been charged with a host of federal felonies, including nine counts for damaging an energy facility, use of fire in the commission of a felony, and malicious use of fire. They've been coerced under that threat of 110 years to plead guilty to conspiracy to damage an energy facility. And, and this is important because of right after No Dapple, you saw all the state legislatures, all of the, the governors write legislation that protected these big extractive facilities. And, and, and so now they are, they are at risk of a terrorism enhancement. And before I go any further, if we have a video of Ruby and Jessica Control, if we could roll that in, that would be great. We're here today at the IUB because of the recent ruling on Friday, where they again had an opportunity to rule with it for the people. Instead, they again voted for oil. And so that's why we've chosen this site as a place to come forward and say what we've, uh, express what we've done. Do you have it? How long are you prepared to go to prison for? How long are you prepared to go to prison for? That is a question. That is something that everyone who's been in those shoes has confronted. Anybody who's who sat there knowing that they could possibly do some time, some serious time, has felt that gut check. And it is not something that you would wish on your worst enemy. Jessica and Ruby are set to be sentenced May 28th, 2021. So they're facing these charges in Iowa. And in light of President Biden riding the fence on the Dakota Access Pipeline, in light of the Army Corps of Engineers being unwilling to vindicate their federal property rights and shut down DAPL, we have to contact all of our congressional reps, all of our senators, President Biden himself, Merrick Garland, the DOJ, any and everyone who we can get to weigh in on what is happening in Iowa because Ruby 
and Jessica do not deserve a single day in prison, even though they have taken responsibility for what was done to Dakota Access Pipeline equipment. The federal government took, excuse me, took two years to charge Ruby Montoya, who's 29 years old, and Jessica Reznicek, who's 38. They've taken responsibility for the series of acts that they said was necessary to protect the rivers and the waterways through which and under which the Dakota Access Pipeline still trespasses. They stand accused of using fire, of using a torch, of destroying tractors and pipeline infrastructures. Both women are directly involved with stand with Standing Rock, with the no dapple struggle. And I don't know how we've kind of left them out, but we need to say their names. Everybody out there who speaks on the Dakota Access Pipeline, who does work related to achieving justice for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, Oglala Sioux Tribe, Yankton, those are the four named plaintiffs, but everybody, 20 million people are implicated in the Dakota Access Pipeline. So if you could contact whoever you can, or perhaps we will drop some sort of call to action, something that people can join to call attention to Jessica and Ruby. They are in dire need of our help, and we will continue to say their names. We will continue to keep them in our hearts and send our voices to those who can drop these charges. These are obviously politically motivated charges. These charges and came about as a result of Trump and the extractive industry controlling the energy policy of our country. Ruby Montoya is a school teacher, and Jessica Reznicek is considering joining a monastery. And human beings mean much more than machines. Capital and property cannot be what is held sacred in our country and in our world. And speaking of capital, it, it brings to mind our guest, who is a founder of Mazaska Talks. But speaking of capital and property, there have been ways to impact our geo geopolitical realities. And Jackie Fielder has done a great deal to impact that change. Today, she's able to join us from the West Coast, where she ran for the state legislature against a crony corporate funded schmo named Senator Scott Weiner. And she came close to defeating Weiner. She's the co-founder of Mazaska Talks, as I've said, which is a divestment portal fighting the extractive extinction machine. And she also founded Daybreak Pack, which uh, I'd like to bring her on to the show to talk about any number of these things. Um, hopefully, Jackie is in the waiting room. Hey, Chris. She yeah. can hear us. Happy to be here. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie, for making time for Cut to the Chase. I really do appreciate it. I've been following your work since 2016. I mean, it's hard to believe that that's five years ago. But yeah, if you, yeah I know. But if you could just uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us what you've been up to lately. Uh, a lot of our listeners, this may be the, the first time that they're meeting you. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me, Chase. I'm excited. Uh, my name is Jackie Fielder. I am a member of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara uh, Nation, three affiliated tribes in the northwest corner of what is now North Dakota. And I have been organizing around fossil fuel divestment since 2017. I started um, the local San Francisco Defund Apple Coalition, and then that turned into the San Francisco Public Bank. 
um, as well as working with other amazing indigenous organizers like Matt Remley and Rachel Heaton on Mazaska Talks. And then fast forward to 2020, I ran for state Senate on a lot of stuff, but corporate free campaign um, to unseat an incumbent. And we got 191,000 votes and we came, uh, we, we didn't clear the hurdle, but we're now working on Daybreak PAC, which is a political action to committee to help recruit and train other candidates to run corporate free campaigns, specifically at the state level here in California. Wow, uh, and you know what? Uh, I remember following that election and we were all, rooting for you because it it picked up a lot of steam you were covered by a lot of big outlets i mean it was it's amazing and so are some of the things that you are working on during your campaign um if you could just talk about some of what your platform might have been are some of the are you able to translate some of that into the daybreak political action committee yeah so i ran on uh, universal health care you know we have three million uninsured californians um, anyone who lost a job in the pandemic is also, you know, has been without health insurance. And we ran on increased renter protections because the housing crisis really has, has ballooned out of proportion here in California. Um, we ran on, on increasing funding for public schools, um, disarming and defunding our police, decarcerating our jails, and, um, as well, we ran on an indigenous wildfire task force, which actually does exist. Since our election, I learned that the budget of, of the state legislature and the governor have allocated about 22 million to prescribed fires that is specifically run by tribes. So, um, so yeah. Um, it's uh it's really exciting to see that our campaign also you know changed what's possible for running a grassroots campaign you know a, a cor corporate free campaign right and we raised seven hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars that way what that's amazing i did not know that that is yeah. uh, wow that's that's uh heavy hitting there jackie so seven, that was in your campaign 777k yes yeah wow uh well congratulations on that that's the first i heard about an indigenous wildfire unit that uh, that is so good to even contemplate because of yeah what has happened in california with climate change or climate collapse or however whatever sense of urgency you want to put around that but i would like to ask you about maza scott talks because i know that you've done tremendous work with that so if you and you've also gone to europe for that advocacy and so if you could just talk about what that means to you and and what you were able to do uh we'd appreciate that yeah so um in 2017 after you know helping launch maza scott talks into the the world we had like a campaign around divest the globe but before that um Muscat Talks was specifically focused on getting attention focused on the banks that were financing all the pipelines. You could divest yourself, you could divest your community. Um, but this was an indigenous led effort. And so I had the honor of being invited to serve on the indigenous women's delegation by the Women's Environmental Climate Action Network. Um, Myself and um, LaDonna Brable Allard, who just passed this weekend, as well as Tara Hauska and Michelle Cook, were all in that delegation to talk to the banks about their financing of the pipeline. And so that's where I got to know LaDonna, where I got to meet her. And we all spoke, you know, for the water. We spoke for our people. We spoke about free, prior, and informed consent. FPIC, which is the international standard for indigenous peoples to basically be respected. Um, unfortunately, banks like to use the loophole of, well, we consulted them. Consultation isn't consent, but they like to play on these words. They sound similar. They're not the same thing. Um, 
and say, well, we consulted with the tribe, our job is done. When in reality, they didn't, they didn't consent. So we talked to the banks about this and, um, you know, we talked to the Norwegian oil fund, uh, ethics committee. We talked to, um, Deutsche Bank, we talked to UBS, we talked to a few others. And it's really hard to just talk the, the, the Wall Street machine out of making millions of dollars, um, especially when our own government doesn't respect us. So that was, that was the indigenous women's delegation in 2017. And shortly after, Mazaska Talks hosted a um, Divest the Globe campaign where we had an international day of, day of day of action um in october yes and i just wanted to give a shout out to matt remley and rachel heaton and of course yourself jackie i i do appreciate everything that you're able to do uh because it's high it's high impact work and i know that you've also done a lot of research i, I can't remember what your educational background is but I know that, you know, a lot of what you do is research and data driven. And that is uh, extremely important in any of the work that is being done. Um, and thank you, everybody who is tuning in, everybody who might be tuning in or who has just tuned in. As we always say, please share these streams because these are, you know, these are stories that you might not hear in the mainstream and if you're just tuning in jackie and probably some others who i don't know are responsible for organizing and and creating a political action committee it is called daybreak pack and jackie i just wanted to give you an opportunity because not a lot of people know what a pack is a political action committee and so if you could just talk about what a PAC is and what you are, you know, what some of your goals and, and dreams and visions are for Daybreak. I want to give you space for that. Yeah. So a political action committee, oftentimes we hear about super PACs that are funded by corporate contributors or billionaires. They're really deceptive, but we're a different kind of PAC. We, um, we support corporate free candidates. We don't accept contributions from corporations. We're entirely funded by people like you and we're sustained by grassroots contributors. Um, we do three things. We recruit candidates for state level office here in California. You know, we would love to support local candidates, but we're really focused on state level change because um, that's where a lot of our, our lives are affected. But the, the premise for this is that, you know, I, I went up against a, a, an opponent, an, an incumbent that was one of the most corporate backed politicians in the California legislature. He has accepted money and, and had, ha has had support from, you know, like Chevron and Walgreens and all these other corporations you wouldn't think have any interest in politics, but it turns out they have a huge interest in politics um, when it comes to business. And so, this pack is dedicated to recruiting and training grassroots candidates who reject corporate money um, to advocate for important legislation that aligns with our platform, like universal healthcare, where phone banking and text banking key districts for that bill right now. Um, we're also uplifting the Corporate Free Elections Act, which is in front of the California legislature. And then we're also doing phone banking for vaccine equity. So we're phone banking parts of San Francisco that were were hardest hit by covid and are under vaccinated right now so we're calling seniors that are 50 years and older to make sure that they know where to go to get vaccinated in their neighborhood and to make sure that they they are connected to resources in, in case they have barriers to um to mobility and things like that i see that that sounds great uh, as we know from the from the 2016 election to the 2018 and 2020 i mean we survived something catastrophic i feel and i'm not my views have also changed like i don't i do i don't we don't need to go easy on or let the blue team off the hook because the corporatocracy is dangerous to all 
human life in all countries, all nationalities. And so the fact that Daybreak is not taking corporate money, that is a huge step. And so for people to support that is the easiest way to go to your website? Yeah, absolutely. Daybreakpack.org. And so that's up. some of our listeners and some of our viewers are thanking you and, and saying that, you know, I just say maybe a lot of people, I didn't know what a pack was until I ran for office the first time. And so we, we hear about the Koch brothers. We hear about dark money. And, you know, think of the NRA. The National Rifle Association, was, which, which declared bankruptcy, which essentially seems to be like a, a proxy for, for Russian oligarch or billionaire money. That is the stuff that comes to mind when, when before when we would think of super PAC. You know, the, the big money lobby, big extraction, big pharma, big everything. All that too big to fail stuff that owns our politicians. So... Jackie Fielder with Daybreak Pack is part of a movement in California. And California is where the Romero Institute, uh, which is kind of the, the umbrella for Lakota People's Law Project, different members of our team have California Green New Deal as, as a focus area because there is a California could it could secede from the union and be something like within a top 10 of gdps in the world or some crazy thing there's i don't know how many millions of people living there but I, I just wanted to to thank you for doing that because tribal nations anybody who might be listening or or watching who's on a tribal council has direct access to those established industries like gaming those budding industries like hemp and cannabis Daybreak Pack is a model that we need to support. Um, and we happen to have Jackie Fielder with us to talk about that. So I don't know if I missed anything, Jackie. I don't want to keep you on longer than I need to, but I just, it's so good to see you again. Um, and it's been a rough couple years, a, a rough one year for sure. And I just want to thank you for running for office. Um, I saw the dynamics shift for you out in California, you're, you're with from defund Dapple to Mazaska to Daybreak and, and throwing in your run for office in that. Those are huge moves. And I, I just want to say thank you. So I, I also want to give you a chance to make any closing remarks, anything that you might have left out for the benefit of everyone viewing. Yeah, I'll just say that none of this would have been possible. I wouldn't be here without... LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who started the, the Dakota Access Pipeline camps, um, Sacred Stone Camp, in April of 2016 on her family's land. And she put out a call on Facebook for everyone to come out. I wasn't one of the ones to come out um, immediately, and my involvement was more towards the end of it. However, I wanted to find a way to continue to keep the movement going, to keep it accessible for anyone around the globe. I was really inspired by South African apartheid and their divestment work around that. So divestment was like the next step. And um, I, I am so honored to have spent um, even a little bit of time with LaDonna on, on the delegation and in talking to banks and um, having her support for my run for state Senate was, was one of the biggest honors. Um, but we, we wouldn't be here without her. And I think that she's, she's such a testament to the kind of ancestor we should all aspire to be. Um, she stood up and stood up in the face of, you know, state surveillance in the face of, uh, you know, difficult community um, fissures, in the face of an oil company, in the face of corporate media. Um, and she stood this whole time with, with one, one thing in mind, and that's the love for her people, the love for their water. 
And so I think that I'm just thinking about her legacy and how we continue that to know that it wasn't about just one person or, or even one place that, that as MLK has said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. So may she rest in peace and her journey to the next life be, be safe. I know that she is now out of, out of pain and finally with Miles, um, her, her soulmate and We'll we'll love her and miss her dearly and continue the fight. Wow, <clears throat> thank you for that, Jackie. Um, again, this has been Jackie Fielder. She is the founder of Daybreak Pack, and uh, Jackie Fielder on Twitter, Jackie Fielder underscore. Please look her up. Please link up with everything that she's got going on because we do need to have indigenous women leading the fight. And, and you can see that that is happening naturally. There are now you know, two women who won in the United States Congress. One is now the Secretary of the Interior. There's something very powerful happening. And, and it also requires sometimes, you know, I got to find that role. I'm finding that out with my daughter, Tokata who says hi, by the way, Jackie, I told her that you're going to be on the show tonight. Um, Tell her I said hello. Yeah, sometimes, find, sometimes men finding the role is just getting out of the way. And so I do want to thank you for coming on to the show. You're more than welcome. Anytime you got something going on, you just hit us up and we'll be at the ready. Again, Jackie Fielder, uh, thank you for saying that about LaDonna. It is, it is, it is, there's a lot of, of, of weight and just, just heavy feelings, heavy emotions that are around everyone that was in her periphery, in, in her circle, her loved ones, in her orbit. It is, she is, we are here because she decided to stand up and she had the support around her to make that happen. And so thank you again, Jackie. Um, thank you. We'll catch up with you soon. Thanks so much, Chase. Thanks, everyone. So that is Jackie Fielder. I met Jackie about five years ago, and she has been blazing trails ever since. So again, those, those couple of sites that you want to catch for Jackie are uh, Daybreak Pack. Just search it up on Twitter, Daybreak underscore P-A-C, and then her personal Twitter. Uh, I suppose it's a campaign Twitter as well. Uh, Jackie Fielder underscore. But I, I want to thank her for coming on the show and for speaking about LaDonna because that is how I want to end tonight's show. And everybody who's who's hung with us, everybody who's shared the stream, everybody who's commented, I am reading your comments, everybody who likes, uh, all of that stuff matters. And that's obviously not why we do these shows for the likes and the in 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 whatever. And for the clout, uh, we do them because we have cutting edge perspectives that need to be shared. We have news that needs to be heard, needs to be seen. And you all who listen live are a part of that. We do this show live. We're about to have a podcast attached to the show that you can then just listen in you know play replay it if you're around the house if you're doing your chores or if you're on a hike or you're on a walk or wherever you're at we want you to be able to catch up with cut to the chase because we've got a good team we've got a good thing going and uh i'm very appreciative of that and i'm just the face of it i'm just the brother who gets to come and sit on the camera and interface with all of you who listen in. And I don't, I don't take that lightly. That is, this is an awesome experience. And, and I just want to end the show tonight by giving LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard her proper due. I want to send words of encouragement to all of her loved ones, 
all of her family, all of those who are grieving heavily, a, a type of grief that is beyond words, that is beyond grasping by the verbal expression of human beings. That is the kind of grief that LaDonna Brave Bull Ellard's family and loved ones and those who were very, very close to LaDonna are going through right now. And those are very, very hard times. As human beings, we face very difficult situations in our life path. And LaDonna is the founder of the Sacred Stone Camp, which provided the original impetus, provided the base from which to launch Ocheti Shakoi. And that launch happened about three months after LaDonna and others, like Joy Brown, like Joseph White Eyes, like Tashina, Sapawi, like everyone who was there, Jacelyn was probably there too. In Standing Rock, I remember being at a com community meeting when Sacred Stone Camp was thought of, when it was conceived, when it was founded. And there was even a sacred fire out on site before Sacred Stone. But LaDonna gave herself to this struggle, gave the land upon which Sacred Stone Camp was built. And she became the face of the Standing Rock movement, the No Dapple movement. Mini Wichoni echoes throughout the multiverse because of people like LaDonna and because of LaDonna specifically. This movement called our spirits. Mother Earth, Mini Wichoni, called us into action, called us to confront those who have thrown mother earth into a climate collapse those corporations who have caused our downward spiral as a human species those corporations who have thieved from us and our children our children the power to know what peace is and in tonight's tribute, I'd like to roll in a couple of videos to pay homage, to deliver a tribute to LaDonna, for LaDonna, to all of you who are still tuned in. And, and I thank you again for your support. I've known LaDonna for a long time. I grew up in the same peninsula, the same island. Long Soldier, or what is called Fort Yates, on the map. I knew her husband, her soulmate, Miles Ellard. He used to pour water in the sweat lodge every Sunday in Fort Yates. And she and Miles were pillars of the community, pillars of Standing Rock. And so we want to lift her up we want to celebrate her we want to commemorate her and carry on in her spirit in the spirit of LaDonna Brave Bull Allard we have to carry on and so if we could just roll the first video we want to commemorate LaDonna I'm for for eight here I was born in the schoolyard just three blocks north of here. And then I bought a house across the street where I grew up. So I'm home. And then my father's house is there on the Cannonball River where I grew up as a small child with my grandma. So all of this, I'm still home. So what does that mean? I'm responsible for making change, not anybody else. I can't wait for government. I can't wait for people to do it for me. We just got to do it. I would never do anything to harm anybody, but I will defend. And I will use any method possible to defend. See my grandkids run out here? 
I love my grandkids. I love my children. And I love my home. And so, to me, those are important things to defend. You know, it's, it's like this. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. Well, thank you for that. Uh, as you can see, LaDonna is an extremely passionate and stalwart grandmother. She, she was a, she's a grandmother to my daughter, and I just want to thank everybody for you know listening, for watching, for giving LaDonna her proper due. And as an additional tribute, I want to show LaDonna's testimony at a hearing which was held in Linton, North Dakota, which is right across the river from Standing Rock from Fort Yates, from our communities. Right across the river is Linton, and they held a hearing there because that is where Dapple's other drill pad is sited. There's one on our side of the river, on the west side of the river, and then there's one on the east side of the river. But this video came from a, a, a Public Utilities Commission hearing during that time when the Dakota Access Pipeline was trying to double its capacity from 500,000 barrels a day to a million barrels per day. And this is very hard to do, but we've got to get through speaking of LaDonna. So if we could roll in video number two, Control. As I stepped over here today, I thought, what an automatic blessing to stand where my family comes from. Because I'm Ihonktua, Pabaska, and Sisitan Dakota. My family village is just right down the road, 120 years ago when we lived. And then my grandmother. My grandmother was born in this place called Odessa, Russia. And she came over here and she did the great crime. She married a full-blooded Indian man. So this little German woman, my grandmother named Eva Kuntz, taught me how to live in this world. My other grandmother, who used to come across the river as soon as it would freeze, would come and do polka with Lawrence Welk. <laughs> I have always thought that this area, Linton, was our friends. Grandma used to tell me bad things all the time. My Grandma Eva, she's like, remember, we're not related to Kuntzes that are Protestants, only the Catholic Kuntzes. <laughs> then I found out it wasn't true. We were related to all the Kuntzes. But just saying that, I am a landowner. I am the closest landowner, the Dakota Access Pipeline. You guys remember me. My name is Tamakawa Shtewi her good earth woman. I'm an enrolled member of Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I am the daughter of a police officer. I am the daughter of my father who is Korean War. My grandfather who was a Lakota code talker in World War I. My uncle was in World War II. I had 16 cousins in Afghanistan and Iraq. I come from a long line of veterans and police officers. Today in this current, my stepdaughters are police officers. My stepson's a police officer. I grew up in a community where there was law and just. I am a historian. I graduated from the University of North Dakota. I have spent the last 30 years compiling the history of this land. Because my original homeland is from the James River to the Missouri River, I know every original name of every creek, every hill, every ceremonial stop in this area right here because it is my home. I know where every village is located and who is the head of those villages. My people had the misfortune of being attacked at the Whitestone Massacre 
My grandmother was nine years old when they shot her and took her to the prisoner of war camps in Crow Creek. And my grandfather, Tutanka Ohitika, who was the spiritual leader at that time. When they released us from the prisoner of war camps in 1871, we made our way back up to the Cannonball River. And at that time, my family buried medicine in that river, and we were taught to protect it. So I come from a multicultural because I grew up and my father and him all spoke German and we all spoke Dakota. I know who I am. With that, I worked for the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. I've spent the last 30 years protecting sacred sites, burial sites, traditional cultural properties, ceremonial sites in North Dakota. As I worked, I walked fields, I tried to explain to deaf ears. And now we are here in this land of my family's home. And I know things about this land. I know the sites here. I know what's here. And it's really hard for us to ask you, what have we ever done? What have we ever done? I live in my own homeland, in my own country. I'm indigenous to this land. The roots go right out of my feet. I have never done anybody ever harm. I have always been good and kind to people. I went to school, I went to college, I bought my own home, I've worked all of my life. What did I do wrong? When you decided to build a pipeline, I thought, I buried my father on this hill so he could have peace, because he asked us to bury him up there where he could see the Cannonball and the Missouri River. On this side of the river in Hazleton, my first husband is buried. I belong to this land. Today, my son lays on top of that hill next to my father and now my husband. My whole life is buried there, across from this pipeline now. So I must spend every day standing on top of my hill to watch, to watch what I know it's coming. And so now you come with an expansion of the pipeline and I still say, what have I ever done? What have I ever done? Because I am not ISIS. I am not a terrorist. I truly believe as you come to take my footprint off this land, you are the terrorists. Because I have never done harm. I was brought up by my father as a police officer who taught me justice, who taught me to follow the law. And now I do not see our police officers following the law. I really had a hard time this last three days. I actually had to sit in my house and cry because I heard they met to say that we were coming to be violent. And I was like, why would we come to protest an amazing area that we come to have comment? That didn't even make sense to me. Are there crackolas in this world that don't understand common sense? We came to speak. We are so honored you gave us the right to speak. And we are so honored that we can sit here in front of you and tell you how we feel. I have learned so much about pipelines that I never wanted to know. I have never been an activist, I'm a historian, but now I am forced to learn about spills and learn about pressure and learn about everything that I never thought a historian would have to know, but now I do. And for me, I listened very intensely as everybody went back and forth, just cute, that they debated amongst each other, and none of them said anything about the land. None of them said anything about the water. And I really don't care about your technical ideas. 
I really don't care about your promises because I have lived with the Army Corps of Engineers. I spent every day in Army Corps Engineers meetings talking about protecting sites. And not once have Army Corps stood up and did anything but destroy. So that's where I'm at. I have no guarantee that you will not protect my people's footprints off this land. There is no guarantee. I would like you to say, oh, if that pipeline spills, we're going to give you $5 billion for the damage you did. I haven't heard that. Because you can't. Right now, I told my people, you know what? We, we, can't, we can't wait for somebody to come save us. There'll be nobody. They will do a spill, and they will leave us. They will leave us like the Army Corps did, taking us out of our homes as people watched the water come in and kill their animals as they drowned it because nobody told us the water was coming in. That is how it's going to be again. So I had our people learn hazmat training, firefighting, first response training. So now when it happens, we will be called because we love the land. We can protect the land. And I have been honored and blessed to have my first great granddaughter born this year. And as you sit here and you talk about my homelands and you do nothing, she will be sitting here talking and standing against this. I will object until I die on this earth. Dakota Access Expansion, Dakota Access Pipeline. I will not back down. I stand on that hill every day and I walk. Wow. <clears throat> there are... Uh... There are no words really that we can kind of uh, say to get a get a grip on what it means to lose LaDonna <clears throat> in physical form. You know, her spirit uh, will carry on and you can tell that she is a force and she was expressing that force. Daku shkashkan. Her legacy will live on forever throughout the ages beyond time. She and everyone who stood with her reverberate across the universe in the fight for the survival of our species, in the fight to reclaim our spirits, to reclaim our agencies, to reclaim our land, to step into our power. We will always remember, we will always stand. Wana wo kik suye na wo yu oniha, chanku nari daya omani. We will honor Ladana's fight to save us from big extraction and the endless war machine, which is trying with all its might to kill our planet and put our children in the next seven generations in desperate collapse, ecological collapse, climate collapse. People like LaDonna recognized this and lived with their every breath to take whatever action was necessary to make sure we can find a different way of life, that we could walk on Mother Earth with our heads held high, looking straight ahead, meeting the world on our terms as indigenous 
nations, original civilizations. LaDonna stood for that light and that energy which still guides us to spiritual liberation. It was hard. It's hard to watch those videos. And we send our love out to her family who is watching over her right now as she is on her journey. And I just want to say thank you for everyone who listened, who paid attention. We honor LaDonna. Tamakawa Shtewi. Eha hey. Tamakawa Shtewi. Eha hey. Tamakawa Shtewi. Eha hey. Tamakawa Shtewi. Eha hey. Good Earth Woman. Wokik Suye. We remember now. Wo you oni ha po. We all honor Good Earth Woman. LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. We will always carry on this fight. And this has been Cut to the Chase number 10. I want to thank you all again every Wednesday at 5 o'clock Mountain Time. We will be here coming to you live. And if we have to deviate from that, we'll let you know ahead of time. I want to thank our team who makes this all possible. I want to thank our sponsors. Lakota People's Law Project and Last Real Indians. Thank you for allowing us to go out over those airwaves and over those networks. Please give us a share, a like, a comment. I want everybody who's listening to know that it means the most to us. It means the most that we can continue to stand in our power. Our power that is peace, that does not allow us to back down. And you saw it watching LaDonna. That was hard to watch. But thank you for sticking with us. Again, this has been Cut to the Chase from the beautiful Black Hills in the Republic of Lakota, Indigenous Territory, Turtle Island. We are out.